Blessings, my brothers and sisters. Thank you all for joining us once again for another session of Measured Faith Bible Study. Hey Amen. Come on in. Let me know how you're doing. Hope your day and your week has been going great thus far. I speak the blessings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, upon your life. Hey Amen. I just thank you all once again for joining us. Uh, we're going to go into prayer. We're going to jump back into this um, lesson in the book of Romans. Hey Amen. Let us go into prayer right quick. Father God, we come before you once again, just thanking you for being so gracious and so kind. Thank you, Lord God, for counting us as your children, for adopting us as family, and for treating us as your own. We thank you, Father God, that even while we were yet still in sin and were outside of your family, that you thought enough of us to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, Father God, to shed his blood, Father God, and to give his life so that we would have a part in your kingdom. And so for that, we're so grateful. We're so thankful, Father God. Uh, as the psalmist said, that if we had a thousand tongues, we could not thank you enough. For when we look back over our life, and think of what you've done for us and where you brought us from and how you kept us, how you made a way out of no way, how you provided for us, how you've uh, 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 forgiven us, Father God, time and time again. We say thank you, Father God. Thank you for being so good, so gracious, and so kind. Thank you for loving us in spite of us. Thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness that you can continue to display unto us each and every day, throughout each and every day. Thank you, Father God, for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your grace toward us. And now that we are gathered here together, Father God, I just pray for every, every person under the sound of my voice. I pray for their homes. I pray for their finances. I pray for their welfare. I pray for their well-being. I pray, Father God, for their minds. I pray for their souls. I pray for their spirit, Father God, and their salvation. I pray that you would touch them like only you can. I pray that they will come to know you, Father God, even now in a way like they've never known you before. I pray that they will experience you and see you even now, Father God, like they've never seen and experienced you before, Father God. Do something new in their lives, Father God. Do something different in their lives. Take them higher with you. Take them deeper in you, Father God. I ask and pray that you would just enlarge their territory. Keep them from any and everything that's not of you so that we may cause no pain, Father God. As we join together this hour, I pray that you would give us an ear to hear, a heart to receive, and a will to obey. Hide me behind your cross and perfect everything which concerns us. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Hey, 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 uh, Sister Sandra. God bless you. Hey, Sister Ladinia, God bless you. Good to see you, ladies. Hey, Sister May Tubby, good to see you all. God bless you all. Hey, cousin, good to see you, Sister Charlene. God bless you. Good to see you all. Thank you all for joining uh, uh, me for another session of Measured Faith. I don't take that lightly at all. You all jump on here every single week, amen, and, and trust me to give sound doctrine and teaching, and so I don't take that lightly at all, and I just want to thank you for your support. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for, you know, just uh, your, your fellowship and your presence. Thank you for uh, uh, your interaction. Thank you for your feedback. And thank you for entrusting me to bring a sound word from God. Amen. I hope you all have been enjoying this book of Romans that we've been in here lately. Uh, man, it's been several weeks, a few months now that we've been in the book of Romans, which is a great thing. Amen. You don't want to rush through the Bible. You don't want to rush through uh, um, um, studying the Bible. We're not in a rush. Amen. But we are on chapter 14 today. But man, we have talked about, I mean, propitiation and justification and how God redeemed us from the law through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, how he justified us. Amen. And, and, and brought us into his family. Amen. How how he has just forgiven us, amen, how he sanctified us and set us apart, amen. So I hope you all have gotten something out of these teachings over the last few months that we've been in the book of Romans. Remember, we talked out, we started talking about how Romans, excuse me, was the fifth gospel, how you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Romans was considered 
to be the fifth gospel, amen. And it's Paul's account of the gospel and what Christ Jesus did for us and who we are in Christ Jesus, amen, and the benefits that we have of being in Christ Jesus, amen. Remember, this is whenever the, Jew, the uh, Gentiles were accepted into uh, the family of God, amen. And they had been dispersed and the Jews had even been dispersed and now they're all coming back to Rome. And so they're what we are called today a blended family, amen. The Jews and the Gentiles are all one family, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation because of the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on Mount Calvary, amen. Last week we talked about in chapter 13 about submission and how it's uh, uh, su submission is of God, amen, and how God calls us to submit to him and to each other, amen, and to his will for our lives, amen. We uh, um, 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 came to the conclusion that you just can't submit to everyone. You don't submit to everyone, amen, but you do submit to those whom God has placed you under or in connection with, amen. We talked about um, 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 women submitting to men and men submitting to God, amen. And, 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 and you don't wanna to submit to a man who doesn't have a vision, amen. So before you get married, um, um, make sure that your significant other is going to be able to lead you, that he has a vision, hey, Sister Pamela, and that he has a calling um, on where God is going to lead you all, amen, as he submits to uh, Christ, which is the head of the church and the marriage. Amen. And so this week we are going to jump in to Sister Ladinia said, Amen. Amen. That if if he ain't got no mission, don't 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 um, submit to him, Sister Ladinia, especially you single women. Amen. If, if, if you ain't married yet, if that joke ain't got no uh mission, if he ain't got no vision from God, hey. Tell him whenever he got a vision, come back because you are a lady of integrity, a, a, a godly woman, and you need somebody who you can submit to. And remember, we talked about submission means sub, where you get the word um, submarine that go under, hey, mama, love you, and then mission, which is what God gives us, amen? So submission, to come under the vision, to come under the mission, amen? And so that's important, that's important, that's important. A lot of people don't want to submit. Uh, a lot of ladies don't submit because the men ain't got no, because uh, the man doesn't have a mission. He, has a, he doesn't have a clear vision on what God has called for him to do and how to lead the family, amen? And so that, that, that makes it rough on a marriage or in a relationship, amen? Anytime you go to your job or something, you want to uh, submit to the mission and to the vision of that company. Uh, you don't want to just go somewhere uh, or get a job or just to be working, you know, um, and they don't have some type of mission statement. They, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're supposed to do. You're all over the place. I mean, anything that that is going to be successful, whether it's in relationship or employment or career or purpose, has to have some type of mission, has to have some type of vision. And you need to be aware of what that is so that you can be successful in what it is you are seeking to do, amen? So this week we're going to uh, uh, jump into chapter 14. I don't know if we're gonna close out Romans this week. We may, uh, then we may not, amen? Let's just see what the Lord has to say. But this week, starting in chapter 14, we're gonna be talking about the weak and the strong, amen. Verse 14, I mean, chapter 14 starts out, Paul says, accept the ones, except the one who is weak, whose faith is weak. I'm sorry. Paul says, except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt. Y'all pay attention to the words here. The one who does not. The one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own masters, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. 
Paul goes on to say, one person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another considers each day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced, hear me here, in their own mind. If you have your Bible, whether it's on a, a, a paperback or, 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 or a um, digital Bible, you should put that, you should highlight that. Each one of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as a special day does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains so to the Lord and gives thanks to the Lord. For no one of so for no one of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us die for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ died and returned to life so that the Lord may be both the Lord of the living and the dead. So million dollar question is, what is Paul saying here in chapter 14? Paul is encouraging us, commanding us and telling us to stop judging others. Stop judging. Stop criticizing people for what they do that's different than from what you do. Now, remember, remember, we're in the book of Romans. Remember, I told you from the very beginning that Romans, Brother A. Ray, good to see you, Rev. Um, the, the book of Romans, it, it, it is imperative. Hear me here. Before, before we even dive into this, it is imperative, my brothers and sisters, that you understand the context of the scripture the context what do you mean by context it is imperative that you understand the time frame that paul was talking about here it is again the the, the uh, jews had been scattered god has ex the, has accepted the gentiles all roads lead back to rome every this big blended family jews and gentiles are now coming back to rome hear me here but the jews had in their law, remember, Paul is trying to detox these Jews because they're wanting to hold on to the law. They want to do all this type of stuff that the law commands and God is trying to tell them, look, you're no longer, I mean, Paul is trying to tell them, you're no longer under that law. You're under grace. You've been justified through grace. Uh, Jesus Christ paid it all. But here it is, some of these Jews, hear me here, they don't eat meat. They only eat vegetables. But the Gentiles, whom God has accepted in, remember we talked about that, the Gentiles whom God has accepted in, they eat meat. The Jews only eat vegetables, but the Gentiles, they eat meat. But if you, so, so here it is, the Jews are condemning the Gentiles because they are eating meat and Jewish people didn't eat meat, hear me here, under the Mosaic law or the Ten Commandments. But if you go back to the book of Acts right before this, you will understand that God done away with that law. Remember in Acts 9 when God um, showed Peter the sheep that came from heaven? And he told Peter, he said, Peter, eat from this sheep. And, 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 and he showed, I, I, I mean, he showed Peter um, the sheep. And, and, and it was all kind of animals. And God told him to take and eat. Well, Peter even con contested with God. He said, no, 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 I can't do that. He said, God, it's forbidden for me to eat these kind of uh, uh, meats under Jewish law. I, I, I have dietary restrictions that would not allow me to eat this. And then God told him in Acts 9, he said, no, 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 no. I have cleansed all things. Do not call anything unclean that I have made clean. You can eat the meat if you choose to eat the meat. So now we get to Romans uh, to Romans 14, and these same Jews, they are now still upholding, hear me here, these Jewish laws. And so Paul is telling them, you're upholding the laws of not eating meat and only vegetables only, but understand that God has accepted the Gentiles in here. They never had these laws. And because they never had these laws, they are not restricted to these dietary restrictions that you are on. And so he says, do not judge them. Be careful on how you judge and criticize them because 
they are eating meat. He said, just because you don't eat meat doesn't mean that they can't eat meat. Just because you want to uphold, hear me here, your Jewish restrictions, don't condemn them or criticize or judge them because they want to walk in the liberty that Christ Jesus has given them. My God, that'll preach all by itself today. Hear me here. Because the Jews had dietary restrictions. But the Gentiles operated in the liberty that Christ Jesus had given them from the book of, of Acts, the ninth chapter, when he said all things are clean. So Paul says, if they bless the food and they give thanks unto God, don't knock them for walking in the liberty that Christ Jesus had made available to them. On the same hand, if you're only going to eat vegetables, they cannot knock you for upholding what your moral conscience is, is calling you to uphold. He says, if your conscience gets to you about eating meat, just don't eat meat. See, there were some Jews who couldn't eat it. They knew that they had been liberated from these dietary restrictions, but their conscience wouldn't let them do it. And so because their conscience wouldn't let them do it, hear me here, they wanted to hold the Gentiles accountable. So can I exegete this and, uh, and, uh, and uh, put it in today's term? That was back then. The same thing happens today in today's time. People often, hear me here, Christians, Paul's talking to the church here. Paul, he's, he's not talking to unbelievers, Minister Antley. He's talking to the church here. Paul says that these people want to criticize other believers. Hear me here. Believers are criticizing other believers because of their own personal convictions. Whew. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. Paul says, stop criticizing others because of your own personal convictions. You see it in the church today. Here it is. Some people say, and I'm not knocking any, anybody's denomination. What I'm saying is some people say women can't wear pants. It's in the Bible. Women should not wear pants. Well, understand that in that context, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and in the Bible in general, hear me here, men didn't even wear pants back in biblical days. They wore tonics. Jesus had on, on uh, 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 um, thongs of um, 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 wrap on him. They wore tonics. They wore robes. Men didn't even wear pants back in those days. So this is why I started out telling you that context is important here. And so to, in, in today's church, uh, um, uh, um, you have some people who, who, who don't believe in wearing pants. Hear me here. If that's your belief, then that's fine. But don't call other people who wear pants other women, rather, who wear pants to church of uh, 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 ungodly or criticize them and judge them and say that they're not safe because they have taken the liberty in Christ Jesus to come as they are. And just because you wear dresses only and they choose to wear pants, your dress doesn't make you any more saved than the person who's wearing pants. Woo! <laughs> I went for all of last year, I didn't eat no meat. I was on a pescatarian diet. Now understand, Tara eats meat. She cooks every single day. Every single day she's gonna cook. But how dare I tell her, you can't eat no meat because I, stop eating meat. I, pescatarian, for five years I was vegetarian. How can I tell her if you eat meat and, 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 and not only vegetables, then you're not worthy. You're not real. This ain't gonna work. No, 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 no. 
I can't put, hear me here, my own personal convictions, hear me here, or preferences on her. So there'd be times she cook me something and then cook her something. Or there'd be times we go out to a restaurant and I'm sticking to my vegetarian diet or to my pescatarian diet. And she over there, you can order all the salmon you want. You can order all the vegetarian food you want. I want a ribeye. I want a New York strip. I want a sirloin. I want a steak. I want it well done. That's how I want it. I can't look down on her or think different about her because she wanted meat. That's just my own personal preference. I dealt with cancer. I changed my diet. It was my own personal conviction. Hear me here. But Paul is saying that believers in the church have the propensity to want to place their own personal convictions on others. And so what happens in the church is that people take their own personal convictions that they have and they use them as spiritual obligations against others. I said, people take their own personal convictions and make them spiritual obligations for others. And so because you don't do what I do, you're not saved. Or they say you're immature. You're not a seasoned Christian. So, so now, 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 I, I don't have a problem with women wearing pants to church. Now, I do believe there is a way that you should respectfully dress in church. I don't believe that a woman, you know, should be coming up with everything showing. But I don't believe you should be at Walmart with everything showing. I don't believe you should go to the convenience store with everything showing. I don't believe my own personal conviction. I don't want. Tara walking out the house with no bonnet on her head. No. I don't want you walking out the house in your pajamas. No. Some things are for the house. But because I see someone out or someone comes into a church house with fitting stuff on or they come in with their pants sagging or they have on a sweatsuit and they're preaching it in, hear me here, I'm not going to say that they're not saved. Just because I like to dress up. I only own a few suits. I just know how to work them and put some blazes and stuff with them. But man, I've sat under some pastors who I had to have on a three-piece suit. I had to learn how to tie the tie. Man, I started tying ties. I'm looking at videos and people like, man, how did you tie that tie? I mean, I was that much into it. I wanted to tie all these different knots. I'm spending money I don't have to try to look good. But if the truth be told, some of the same pastors who are wearing these three-piece Armani, Versace, tailor-made suits are going to bust hell wide open because they look better on the outside than they, than they are living on the inside. And so your Versace or Armani or, or, or Burberry or, 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 or Chanel gown or shoes or Louis Vuitton heels, it's not going to get you to heaven. God is not worried about what you wear. I believe everybody should look presentable. But there are some people who wear some red bottom heels. There are some pastors who wear some, some, some tailor-made $5,000 suits who are going to bust hell wide open. And there are going to be some women who wear skirts that's a little bit too tight, that's a little bit too revealing, who are going straight to hate, who, who, who are going straight to heaven. So we have to be careful with judging people. And hear me here. Paul says, that's why I told you to underline that in verse 5. Paul says, whatever you are convinced in your own mind, whatever your conscience tells you is okay, Paul said, you have the right and the liberty to do it. 
Because I'm a living witness. People in the church, believers, I'm not knocking the church. I'm just telling you what to look out for. People in the church, believers, will try to uh, 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 make you uh, um, um, or, 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 or vicariously live through you. And so because they grew up wearing suits, you got to wear a suit. Because they grew up wearing the uh, gowns and the big old hats, you got to wear it. And so we have to be careful with letting others put their own personal convictions on us in making it spiritual obligations. Hear me here. If, if, if you are a Nazarite in the Bible, you could not drink no wine. You have to abstain from all wine. Remember, context is important here. If you were a Nazarite in the Bible, you could drink no wine whatsoever. You were not allowed to drink wine. But then Paul says in the New Testament, if you're not a Nazarite, you can drink it modestly. As long as you do it in with respect. As long as you're not getting drunk off of it. But there are some now there are some people who abuse it. Now, it's just what it is. Who don't need to drink at all? But just because you see someone drinking or having a drink of wine, I am not telling you to drink. Do not say that. And if you ain't been drinking, don't start drinking. Because I said that I'm giving you examples in scripture. I'm just saying there are some things in context that pertain to the Nazareth right law. To the Nazarite law. But then there are some freedoms that we have that we can operate in. But we have to be careful with judging others. And then we have to stop thinking because someone wears a dress or because someone may have had a drink or because someone doesn't wear pants or someone does wear pants or someone eats pork or someone just eat vegetables. Hear me here. We have to get mature enough in our walk that we stop letting, hear me here, our differences become deficiencies. We have to stop taking differences as deficiencies. Just because I think different than you doesn't mean that I'm not as mature as you or that I'm not as saved as you. If you saved, you saved. If I'm saved, I'm saved. But oftentimes we have the propensity to think because one does this and the other does this, that I'm more saved than you or that I'm not saved. If you're saved, you're saved. Stop letting difference, stop interpreting differences as deficiencies. I don't have to think like you. I don't have to act like you. I don't have to dress like you. I don't have to talk like you. I don't have to walk like you. I don't have to preach like you. I have to do what God calls me to do. Now, in some sense, hear me here, on the flip side, there are some things that you just cannot do as a Christian. And the Bible is clear on that. There are some things that you just cannot do. And the Bible is 100% clear on what you cannot do in today's world, in the context that we are living in today. There are just some things that you cannot do. And there should be no debate about that. But whenever we talk about stuff like women shouldn't speak in church because the Bible says that a woman needs to be silent. Stop it. You still have pastors who are misinterpreting that scripture. In those times that Paul is referring to in the book of Corinthians, the reason why he said that, because there would be debates going on. And men would have debate about scripture. And when they debate, Paul says that a woman should not get in the debate with the men. That if she has a question, she should ask her husband in, in private or at home. That's all it's saying, that a woman should not debate with a man in those times. You hear me? It's not saying that a woman cannot preach. Stop it. That is not what Paul is saying. 
As a matter of fact, God himself said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Men and women, sons and daughters shall prophesy. Okay? So when his spirit comes up on you, if he spoke through a donkey, he can show enough speak through a woman. But oftentimes, hear me here, the church believers have misinterpreted that passage of scripture and they hold women back from ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's one of the most craziest interpretations of the Bible that I've heard. And I know some women who can just flat out preach a man. I'm talking about flat out preach a man with the anointing. I'm not talking about with eloquent speech and big words. I'm talking about flat footed anointed preaching. I know women. I've seen women. One of them produces the show for me. Can just flat out preach a man. Not that it's a competition. But stop trying to tell God who he can use and what he can do. So Paul says that if your conscience tells you not to eat meat, don't eat it. If your conscience tells you if you're okay with eating meat, Paul said walk in the liberty that Christ Jesus gave you in Acts 9 and eat you some meat. God is not going to send you to hell for eating meat. Now there are some things we can go to hell for. But God says eating meat is not one of them. And just eating vegetables only is not going to get you into heaven either. <laughs> okay? Do we have that understood? So Paul says in chapter 14, stop judging people. Stop condemning people. Stop taking your own personal convictions and using them as spiritual obligations for others. Which brings me to my next point. In verse 15, Paul says, even if they are weak, he calls it weak, but even if they choose not to, is what he's saying there, proper context. If they choose not to eat meat, or if their faith hasn't gotten, if they choose not to abstain from meat and their faith hasn't gotten there yet, where yours is, Paul says in verse in chapter 15, verse 1, he says, we who are strong ought to bear the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Paul says, each of us should please our neighbors for their good and build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the, in, the insults of those who insulted us fall upon me. Paul said, in Romans 15 and 1, that if you are weak, that, that, that if you are strong, you ought to bear your brother or sister's weaknesses and stop trying to please yourself. Paul says, stop trying to look down on others because you may be more spiritually mature than they are. Your faith may be a little bit stronger than theirs is. They may be struggling in areas that you're not struggling in. Paul says, but you should build them up. You should edify them. You should not tear them down. And one of the church's biggest, I guess, stigmas is that we have a hard time building each other up. And oftentimes, hear me here, that's why people don't like to tell others about their weaknesses, about their failures, about their shortcomings. Because instead of us building people up, we tear them down. You know you shouldn't do that. You know you shouldn't uh, 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 be over there. You know you shouldn't be doing that. If I'm struggling with something, build me up. Encourage me. Tell me I can do it. Don't tear me down. Hear me here. Paul says to please yourself. Y'all know the old, old um, proverbial saying, blowing out other people's candle is not going to make yours shine any brighter. But oftentimes, we try to put people down, hear me here, to make us look good. We want to show other people's weaknesses so that we can try to look strong. 
But remember, in chapters one and two, we said all of our names are somewhere on that list. Even Paul himself said in chapter seven, I got some stuff that I'm dealing with. I struggle from time to time. So when we see our brother with a weakness, hear me here, Paul said we should not uh, 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 try to put them down. Hear me here. He says, because you're going, remember, they were talking about eating meat and eating vegetables. Paul says in verse four in chapter 15, he says, for you're going on things that were written in the past. He says, you're going off of past teachings. He says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. He says, those Jewish laws that you are going by, they were there in that context, in that time, to teach you something. They were not there for you to pull others down. And some of the, whew, my God, help me, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Some of the worst Christians that get on my nerves, some of the Christians that get on my nerves the worst are those, hear me here, who've been in church for a while and they know how to quote the Bible and they know how to, when to sing and when to praise and they know how to dress and play the part. And when they see somebody, a new believer or a novice, as you want to call it, somebody who may be naive somewhat, and now they want to try to condemn them because they've learned, hear me here, the church way. And so they know when to shout. They know when to fall out. They know when to dress. They know how to dress. And so they get so caught up in themselves that they forget how to build a novice, a newcomer, a baby in Christ up. And so they start quoting scripture. You can't wear no um, pants in here. Women, you can't cut your hair. You can't speak in the church. Paul says that every single thing was written in the past was written to teach us. So when you take stories in the Bible, say the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, the Bible, my brothers and sisters, hear me here. It's not a history book. The Bible is a book that gives us instructions on what God wants us to do in today's time. It's not necessarily a historical book. It's a life book. It's a book of instructions. So Paul says, you're looking at the Bible and you could take the three Hebrew boys he says, and you're looking at the fiery furnace, and you're looking at how the uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar got so mad and furious that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow down to him, and that they, and, and that they kept um, serving their God. That he got so furious that he turned the fiery furnace up seven times higher, and then he threw them in there. And the people who threw them in the fiery furnace, hear me here, the fire was so hot that it burnt them up. And then once he threw them in there, he stepped back and he looked in the fire and he seen four people and he asked them, well, there are three people in there, but now I see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of man. And he brought them out of the fiery furnace and they came out unscathed and they didn't smell like smoke. Let me hear, that's a story that's written in the past. Don't get so caught up in the details of that story, hear me here, that you forget, hear me here, to uh, 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 um, get the lesson out of the story. This is what Paul says. Paul said that that story was written to teach us something. Yes, the details are important. But if you only understand the details of the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, if it doesn't teach you that God will be with you when things get tough, 
If it doesn't teach you that there's no situation that God cannot pull you out of. If it doesn't teach you that no matter how bad it gets, God will step in there with you, that he'll never leave you, that he'll never forsake you. If it doesn't teach you that you can stand on the word of God when the world is telling you to do everything that you that, that it wants you to do, that's the lesson. So Paul's saying, don't get so caught up on the details of stories in the Bible that you forget the lesson that it's trying to teach us. My God. Don't get so caught up on God splitting the Red Sea and the details of it that they went through on dry ground that you don't apply that to your life and let it teach you that no matter how 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 you may be drowning in student debt in 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 in, 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 in a financial debt how you may be drowning in discouragement how you may be drowning in in in, in trials and tribulations don't paul says paul says what that uh, scripture is trying to teach you is that no matter where you're at in your life that God knows how to part it and make a way out of no way. That he'll bring you through on dry ground. You see what I'm trying to... Paul says that that stuff that was written was written to teach us something. It wasn't there for you to put everybody down for. It wasn't there for you to try to use it to make yourself look bigger than everybody else. See, he says it. I didn't say it. Don't get mad at me. Paul said it. He said it right here in verse 4. He said, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us something. It's not there to, to, to tear people up. It's there to teach you something. Whatever Jesus fed the 5,000 souls with two fishes and five loaves of bread, that's not there. You can't just get caught up in the details of that. When he asked the disciples, where are we going to get food to feed them? He already knew what he was going to do. They didn't have no food. But he found a little boy with his sack lunch that his mama had packed for him. Two fish and some bread. Two pieces of fish and some bread. And the Bible says that he took that, gave thanks to his father, offered it up to his father, and he fed 5,000 and still had basketfuls left over. Don't get so caught up in the details of that event that it doesn't teach you the lesson that no matter how much you don't have, God is able to take what you don't have and multiply you know what that teaches me? That when I'm down to nothing, God is up to something. You know what that teaches me? That God is able to take the little bit that I have and he's able to multiply it and give me more than enough. Not for only me, but the Bible says that they blessed the disciples had 12 baskets full to take home. That not only will he give enough for me, but he'll give me enough to bless those who are connected to me, who are a part of me. That's what that teaches me. Paul says, stop using this stuff to tear people down. Use it to build people up and to teach them who God is. How God can come through. How God can make a way. Paul said, we are to edify one another. See, what's happened in the church today, hear me here. What's happened in the church today is that too many preachers too many women and men of God have gotten caught up on preaching this prosperity gospel in this naming and claiming and having and grabbing that they don't teach you the lessons in the details of the story. And so they want to teach about how God will multiply or preach about how God is multiplied and they want to ask you for an offering afterwards. But what I'm trying to tell you is that there is a lesson in the details. The lesson is not for me just to get an offering from you. The lesson is for you to apply to your life when you find yourself in a similar-like situation. 
Woo! The Bible teaches us how to live life. And this is why I pray, my brothers and sisters, and I'm going to need y'all to be in prayer with me. This is why I pray that when the church, when, when, when the church doors really do open back up, my prayer, and I need y'all to stand in agreement with this, my prayer is that men and women of God who are preaching and teaching the gospel would teach the unadulterated, unedited, omnipotent word of God. That we will not dilute it to this habit of grab it, name it, or claim it, patty cake gospel. But that we will preach and teach sound doctrine that people can get the lessons out of and not just the details out of. My God. Paul said that this was written to teach us something. This was written to be a compass for us. This was written to be an, an instructions for us. Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Bible, B-I-B-L-E, your basic instructions before leaving earth. It teaches you how to live life. It's not there for you to tear each other down. It's not there for you to, 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 to try to look a, a, a smarter or wiser than everybody else. It's not there just for you just to please yourself. Is there to teach you how to live according to the perfect divine will of God. And I get frustrated when people don't preach and teach the authentic, unedited word of God, hear me here, with sound doctrine and theology. Because so many of us who are believers, we end up living defeated lives, hear me here, because we're not getting sound doctrine. That's why you have to be careful on whose leadership you sit under. I'm going to say it again. You have to be careful with whose leadership you sit under. Because whoever you sit under is what you understand. I said, be careful of whose leadership you sit under, because whoever you sit under is what you um, understand. And I need you to be healthy in your walk with God and not want to kill yourself when trials and tribulations come and not question God just because you're going through some stuff. But see, we're raising some believers who really love God, but we're raising them with this weak patty cake gospel that tells them that they're so important, that they're so beautiful, that they're so handsome, that they're so intelligent, that they're so much children of God that they'll never go in through anything. And it's completely unbiblical. It's unsound doctrine. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. But let me teach you how to deal with trouble. Let me teach you how not to throw in the towel just because you're going through stuff. Let me teach you how not to lose your mind when you go through some stuff. Let me teach you how to bless those who talk about you and, 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 and forgive those who persecute you. He says it's in the book. My God. So chapter 16, look here, we're going to get through Romans tonight. Chapter 16, Paul leaves one final instruction for them. 16 and 17, Paul says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, and after all I've told y'all, listen, Paul says, I urge you to watch out for those who call divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are, ser are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but they're serving their own appetite. I'm going to read it one more time. Paul said in Romans 16 and 17, I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. 
for such people serve their own appetites and not Christ. Paul says that we have to be discerning enough to know who's preaching and teaching sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Paul says, watch out for those who cause divisions Watch out for those who place stumbling blocks or obstacles in your way. Man, I've been with some people and they wanted me to be a part of their organization or their denomination or whatever. And man, after they got through telling me what I had to do because of what their denomination wanted me to do, I said, well, wait a minute. I know you're a man of God. I know you're a woman of God. But this ain't for me. Because here it is. All these obstacles you putting in my way. By the time I try to remember what you want me to do. And he want me to do. And what I got to do for you. I done totally forgot what God called for me to do. <laughs> so I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to just go at home. And do what God called for me to do. Because you got too many doors that I got to knock on and open and walk through just to please you and your own appetite. Paul says, watch out for people who cause divisions and want you to do things, hear me here, that just benefit them and not Christ Jesus. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long, how much you love your pastor. If your pastor is not helping you to grow, hear me here, in Christ. If you are not growing, you need to find you a church where you can grow spiritually. You hear me? If you still dealing with the same thing, with the same thing over and over and over, and you haven't grown none spiritually, either you need to check yourself or you need to check the teaching that you're getting. I want to believe that you all get on here every, I mean, y'all get on here every single week. And I'm humble. But I want to believe that y'all get on here because you're getting something that you can apply to your life. If not, you're crazy. I am a YouTube fanatic when it comes to preachers. I love good teaching. I love good preaching. But if I get on there and you preaching about yourself or you preaching the stuff that I know is not correct or sound doctrine, click. I'm getting off of your YouTube. I'm getting off of your Facebook. I don't want to hear it. If you're preaching to satisfy your own appetite, if your preaching, hear me here, does not point me to Christ Jesus, I don't want it. You don't have to have every verb right. You don't have to have every consonant in the right place. You don't have to have every noun in the right place. If you can lead me to Jesus Christ, then I'm good. But if your preaching fulfills your own appetite, your own ego, and builds you up, peace, I'm out. Don't sit under anyone who cannot lead you to Christ Jesus. Paul says, separate yourselves from them. Let me tell you something. Separation is spiritual. If people are causing divisions and stumbling blocks, and obstacles in your way and preventing you from serving Christ and you are not growing, separate yourself. Separation is spiritual. Now, I'm not saying, hear me here, I am not saying that you should separate yourself from everyone that you disagree with or that you have a difference with. No, that's immature. I'm not saying that. Do not separate yourself from every, you're going to have disagreements. If I haven't said something on here after all these weeks that you may have questioned or disagreed with, you ain't really listening to me. 
I don't agree with everything nobody said because I'm a different person. But just because I don't agree with you doesn't mean I don't understand what you're saying. Doesn't mean I can't necessarily, I, I can't really relate to it. We can have disagreements and differences and still be connected. But if you're preventing me from growing, if you're preventing me from, from, from becoming a mature in my walk with God, if you're placing obstacles in my way that prevents me or impedes me from getting a, 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 a closer walk with God, if it deters me, if it pushes me away, no, 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 no. I'm separating myself from you. If I can't grow and be who Christ called for me to be in the full capacity that he's called me to be, we're going to have to have a spiritual separation. Who was it? I believe it was Paul and Barnabas or Paul and one of them. Whenever Paul told them, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. That's a spiritual separation. I don't wish bad on you. I don't wish harm on you. I don't wish your ministry fail. I don't wish you get fired from your job. I don't wish your marriage fail. I don't wish none of that. But we cannot walk together and be successful. So because of that, I'm going to separate myself from you and wish you the best. And it's okay. Now, again, don't separate from everybody. Don't, don't, don't be like that. You need people. People need you. We were not created to live alone. Man was not created to live alone. That's not necessarily just with a woman. We need relationships. So you can't just separate yourself from everybody. You can't be that secluded. You can't be that much of an introvert. You have to have some relationships with some people. Just make sure the relationship that you have and the people that you are connected to are those who will help you grow in your walk, propel you to the next level, who compliment you. Hear me here. And whom you can help likewise in return. Amen. And so Paul says, stop judging in chapter 14. Paul says, learn the lesson in chapter 15. And then in chapter 16, Paul says, and if all come down to it, know that there is a spiritual separation that needs to take place. Lot and Abraham had to separate. God had two different purposes, two different things. Lot kept on acting crazy. Okay, we need to separate. You take the east, I'm going to take the west. Go your way. I'm praying for you. I love you. I'm here if you need me. But we're not going to keep on continuing to walk, Abraham said. So Lot, you, whatever you want, you go get it. And I'm going to go in the opposite direction, and you go in the opposite direction, and we're going to live our lives in, 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 in a, in a, in a, to, to, to the fullest. My prayer for you, my brothers and sisters, is that you've learned something from the book of Romans. I hope it has blessed you, and I have blessed you as much you have, as much as you have blessed me. You all have been a blessing to me. Again, each and every week, y'all get on here, man. And that blesses my soul. It, it really does. Y'all could tune into a whole, I know there's a thousand million different preachers who y'all can tune into who's a whole lot better teacher and preacher than I am, who's more eloquent and can articulate and know Hebrew and Greek. But y'all keep coming here for me, man, just to hear my little self uh, expound on what God has given me. And I'm so humbled and so grateful. And I thank you all for your support. You all are helping me to grow in my walk in ministry with Christ Jesus. And for that, I am so grateful. And so I don't take that lightly. And I thank you. And so my prayer is that you continue to grow in your walk with God, that you continue to excel, that you continue to seek the face of God, that you learn the lessons God needs for you to learn in his word. So when life presents itself, when life happens, you'll be able to stand on the word of God and know that God is able. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And may the Lord continue to perfect that which concerns you. Uh, I'm going to let you know now. I seen Tara post on Facebook. She was going on vacation. And so I asked her, where was you going, girlfriend? And some of y'all said she going on vacation with her boyfriend. So I'm going to spy on her next week.
I'm not going to be here next week. We're going on vacation. I need a vacation, okay? We're getting ready to start school. I need a vacation. I need to uh, rejuvenate, relax, and um, and restore. And so I need to spend some time with Tara. We need to spend some time together. So thank you all for allowing us. We'll be back the next following week. Keep us in your prayers. That's right. I'm going to spy on her and her boyfriend. I'll show later. I, I, I got to see who he is. I'm going to. They won't leave me now. <laughs> I love y'all. God bless you. Thank you all for joining. Until next time, go in peace, serve God, continue to look to the hills from which come at your help. I love you. God's in love with you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Peace.